Hi, I'm Larry McCullough with the Hall Institute of Public Policy. We're here to continue our series on the American Voter 2012. Today we're going to be talking about taking the pulse of the Vox Populi. Um, our guest today is Professor Patrick Murray of the Monmouth University Polling Institute in West Long Branch, New Jersey. He is the director of that institute. And he has been named Pollster of the Year by PoliticerNewJersey.com. He's been interviewed for his opinions of our opinions on CNN's The Situation Room, ABC's Good Morning America, many other national news shows. Basically, when people want to know what people in New Jersey are thinking, they come to the Polling Institute and Professor Murray. Um, one political consultant has said that the job of a pollster is to translate poll numbers into strategic recommendations that identify who your voter should be, what is of the greatest concern to those who should be voting for you, and how you can best influence those groups. Is that the essence of political polling today? That's the essence of a candidate's pollster. I mean, that's not what we do. Um, our job as at the Monmouth University Polling Institute is to give the voice of the public uh, a seat at the table, whatever that voice is, and to have policymakers react to them. So it's a different, we'd serve a different mission. If I were a candidate pollster, that's exactly what I would be trying to do. I'd be trying to find um, areas of strength, areas of weakness, um, and advising my candidate to emphasize the strengths and de-emphasize the weaknesses. You can't change what you want to do, and you don't, you don't advise a candidate to lead by the polls. You don't, you don't advise uh, a politician in office, an office holder, to govern by polls. Uh, but the role that polls play within internally in a campaign is to strategically to tell you, okay, this, this is going to resonate a lot better, so let's focus on that. But for a public pollster like myself, Ours is kind to, you know, to, to th throw rocks at the, at, at the institution there and, and say, hey, this is what the public are thinking. You have to react to that. Now, either you have to react to that by saying, okay, we're not following the public will. We need to change what we're doing. Or what we're doing is good for the public. The public just doesn't understand it. We have to explain it better to them exactly what we're doing. But that's the role that a public poll, like what I, uh, what I do, plays. Uh, in an election season, we would play a slightly different role, which is basically saying exactly what's going on right now. Sort of a snapshot of how Exactly, and it is a snapshot. I mean, that's one of the things that we find uh, with polls, and things have been changing over the, over the past years. Uh, there are now more and more polls, and they've become more and more part of the story during an election campaign. And what happens is uh, people follow the smallest movement in polls as if they mean something large. And they look at polls that we do in the summer, and say, hey, your poll's off. It doesn't look like what the electorate's going to look like. Well, who, who knows what the electorate's going to look like? Uh, so for example, in 2008, the exit polls of people who voted that day uh, showed that Democrat, self-identified Democrats had a seven-point advantage at the polls. Four years before that, it was dead even. Same number of Republicans, same number of Democrats. And then four years before that, I think it was a four-point margin for Democrats. So every year it's different. Um, and it's because it's different because people th how they think about themselves. But polls actually have a very uh, iffy um, history of predicting the eventual outcome a few months away from the election because that's not what they do. They take a snapshot of exactly what the electorate looks right now, uh, and a good poll will tell you more than just who's ahead in the horse race in the, in the election. It will tell you why. It will tell you what's going on underneath, what kind of the, are the dynamic of the voters. Um, and so that one of the problems that we have are we have some pollsters out there who just try to predict an election. So everybody looks at them and their numbers are different from everybody else's numbers. Why is it? Well, they're doing something different. They're trying to predict what's going on, whereas others of us are trying to figure out what's going on right now and why. Why are people changing their mind? Why are they moving around? Why did, are Democrats less likely to turn out right now than, than Republicans? I'm not trying to predict what's happening right now. I'm trying to explain why things are happening the way they are right now and where that might lead down the, down the future. Yeah. When did polling start to be used really heavily in American elections? When do people really say this is critical? Well, it's, it's funny because if you, you go back to um, the first election where really polling methodology uh, became to the forefront was back in 1932. Uh, and that was, there was a magazine called the Literary Digest back there that had, I think, that was the most widely read magazine in the country. Uh, and they would send out uh, surveys uh, to all their subscribers and to people who they found in the telephone book, people who had car registrations, all sorts of things, wherever they can get a list of people, they would send them out. And they'd get tens of thousands of responses back. So in the 20s, uh, they had a good 
they had a good record of predicting who the eventual winner was. But in 1932, they predicted that Franklin Roosevelt would lose his re-election bid. And of course, Franklin Roosevelt won in a landslide. Uh, whereas uh, a little known pollster at the time, a guy named George Gallup, had a poll out using a different methodology with, with only uh, a couple thousand people in his sample, and he got the winner right. One, one of the things we don't remember is his margin was really well off, but he, at least he predicted Franklin Roosevelt. So it, it made people sit up and, and look at polling and what, what was it about, and how could you interview such a small number of people and uh, get, the, get the numbers basically right. Uh, and so what's happened is then the polling became important, people started paying attention to it. Candidates and, and, and politicians in office started using polling internally to figure out what was going on and how, the, you know, basically their own report card. And it was basically, I would say, uh, you know, up through the 70s and 80s, we really had just a few pollsters that people paid attention to. Gallup was the big, still the big name. Uh, then starting around in the 90s, we just had polls jumping up all over the place. And certainly over the last four to five years, uh, that's become uh, much more important. So it's, it, the question is, you know, whether it's critical or not, um, it's hard to answer because it's, it, the, the, the question that I'm answering is, how much attention are we paying to polls? And we're paying attention to polls a lot more now, although we're also discounting them a lot more now because, because there's so many of so, them. so much noise out there. Yeah, I think that's what a lot of people wonder is like, okay, I see this poll that says one thing and then I see the next poll from equally reputable source and are completely different, opposite ends. Is it the methodology? Is it the sampling? Is it, is it, is it, uh, how do you construct a poll? Right. Yeah, in most cases, uh, there are slight methodological differences uh, that and, and sometimes sub, substantial uh, methodological differences. Uh, so, for example, some pollsters will use lists of registered voters to sample from. Others will use random telephone numbers and then try to drill down and get people to self-identify that they're registered voters. The difference is, if you, if you call from a list, you know the person's already registered. But lists only have listed telephone numbers. So there's a lot of people that you miss if, they have an, if you can't get their telephone number. Uh, and that's why a lot of pollsters use the random digit dial method, whereas they get all the households and cell phones in the country and then try to drill down because at least they know they're not missing anybody, but the problem that they have is an over-reporting of whether you're registered or not. What we found is that both of those methodologies seem to have coalesced a little bit right now um, because the lists are getting better because there's mo multiple sources where people, uh, you know, there's companies out there and that's all they do is try to track down phone numbers and they do a good job of that. And what we're finding over time is that people who aren't registered to vote tend not to answer telephone surveys. <laughs> um, so it doesn't matter that much, yeah. and, you, and you can actually uh, uh, alleviate some of the issues. Uh, but what we find is like in a high turnout election, like the president, uh, there's usually not much of a difference. In a low turnout election, like for Congress in an off year, um, I find, and this is my personal opinion, is that uh, List list sample actually does better than the than the overall sample because then the turnout is so low that the lists are actually a better predictor of who's going to turn out. And one of the the issues that we have though with why some of the polls are different is simply because there's something that we call the margin of error. And while polls are very good at pretty much telling you what the public is like using a small sample, that sample still has a margin of error. And most polls that we see out there have anywhere from a three to four to five point margin of error. And when we say something is very different, if you actually look at the numbers, the numbers are not that much different. So for example, if one poll comes out and says the president's job approval rating is 62% and another one comes out and says it's 64%, most people don't think much about it. Two point difference, who cares? But if one poll comes out and says, uh, the incumbent is ahead in the election by one point, and another poll comes out and says the challenger is ahead by one point, somehow they're vastly different, Okay, yeah. yeah. right? But it's the same margin, <laughs> it's the same exact margin. So when we look at election polls, we, we judge uh, polling by using a much more stringent standard than polling can live up to. It is, a, it is science, but it's an inexact science. Yeah, now, do you ever, uh, let's talk a little bit about voter focus groups, because we've been, I guess, talking so far about telephone. Um, uh, polling. What happens when you get people in a room, complete group of strangers, and you try and get them to talk about issues that matter to them? How does that work? Yeah, well, we got, you know, it's interesting because focus groups, you talk about polling becoming more popular. Focus groups have become more well known, but in fact, they've become less known because what we see as focus groups most of the time in the media on TV are not what we would really call focus groups, those of us who use them uh, and try to use them well. 
Uh, so when you look on TV and you see a moderator standing in front of a room and there's 25 people lined up in chairs in front of, facing him or her and raising their hands to answer questions and being called on individually, that's not a focus group because they're not focused <laughs> on each other. A focus group is where you get, uh, you, you actively recruit people who are like-minded in some way or share some sort of set of characteristics. You get them and sit them around a table or sit them in a room or in a circle where they can be comfortable talking to each other. The role of a focus group moderator in that instance is to throw something out in the middle of the table and see what happens with the people uh, interacting with each other. Because a good focus group is not just simply serial asking people, okay, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, because we can do that with a poll. Uh, it's getting people to start talking in their own language, and that's the key. That's where focus groups are important. This is what help, focus groups help policymakers and politicians figure out exactly what's going to go on. Because the poll can say, hey, this message is more, is, is more uh, useful than that message. And, but exactly how useful, why, what is it that it's sparking? And so you can get a focus group and you can show people, for example, you can show them, advertisements and you can say okay what's the first word you think of when you when you see that saw that advertisement and so they can show it some words and then you can ask them why you can try to get them to start talking back and forth so you can see what kind of emotional bells start to ring for people when they do that uh, to give you an example of a famous focus group that nobody ever heard of but probably if affected an election was back in 1988 um, back then, uh, Vice President George, then Vice President George Bush was running against Massachusetts Governor Mike Dukakis, and in the, in the summer it was far behind, I think 10, 15 point behind in most of the polls, uh, and said we need to figure out some way to gain traction against him. Uh, and we're not sure which, we, you know, we've polled a bunch of different messages, but it's not clear which one works better. So what they did is they got a focus group together and they started testing messages. And they included the Willie Horton message. Uh, that's become infamous now. But there are other messages too, such as pollution in Boston Harbor and a couple of other things. And what they found in this focus group was that it was the cumulative, if they can accumulate those messages, if they just showed one or another and asked them to isolate those, people didn't move their opinion. But it was, one was enough to say, oh, I'm not sure about the guy. It was the second and the third that built on that. So you had to do it in a cumulative effect. And that's what the focus group found out that a poll would never tell you. And in fact, that focus group um, was done with what we call Reagan Democrats at the time back in the 80s from Bergen County. Wow. It was the focus group was actually conducted in Paramus. Oh, man. God. Um, so the 1988 election probably turned on a group of a dozen voters from Bergen County. Wow. That's something. Yeah. Now, um, you showed me a while back a DVD of a uh, uh, focus group you did for the governor's race here in 2009, and I found it fascinating because, again, complete strangers, to get them to open up and to feel unselfconscious, even though actually right in the room there was a camera, I believe, you right. know, and of course people do become oblivious to cameras uh, at a certain point, but still these are strangers, and it's almost like the 12 angry men right. thing where these strangers come in and, and suddenly they're bearing their souls, and you got them to do that. You know, yeah, and, and, and that the key for that was that we were trying to figure out, well, there was this group of people still undecided yeah. in this election, and why were they undecided? Like, what did they need to hear? What weren't they sure about in that election? Because it was an incumbent election, so usually you make a decision about the incumbent, and you decide whether you're going to stick with the incumbent or go with the challenger, but this was a group who hadn't made their minds up yet. And we knew that because these were people who we had polled over the past previous months. So what we did is we went back in our polls, and we identified all the undecided voters, and we recruited a bunch of them to come in and, and sit down with us and do that focus group. And it's, the idea is that you, 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 when, when they get into the room, they understand that they have some sort of shared experience. So they, they kind of know off the bat. So if, if the group is too um, diverse in, in opinions, too diverse in experiences, in race, in, in income, all sorts of things, they kind of sense that and they'll hold back. So you, one of the keys to getting a good focus group is making sure people get there and understand that they're in the, mo the room with somewhat like-minded people. Because uh, you don't want an argument, really. You don't want right, debate. Right. You want people to kind of build off each other's... Right. You, you want people to acknowledge what the other person said and then agree or disagree with it, but start the conversation rolling because once they start free-flowing, then words and phrases start popping up that kind of are really what their subconscious is telling us that they are really interested in uh, and are really driving their decision-making. Uh, and so that really... Um, is is helpful for those of us who want to understand but also the campaigns as i said use this because it's helpful for them to say okay what are those keywords or phrases or images that will really kind of register with people uh, and get them to sit up and take notice
Yeah, and, and uh, the current campaign, uh, and again, you see so many things in the media about what issues are important to people. How do you think, um, quote, undecided voters, uh, in your experience, um, finally make up their minds? I mean, I mean, what would you say? Well, you know, one of the things that, from all the research that I've done with undecided voters is that it very rarely has to do with the issues of the day. Mm -hmm. It has to do with something about that voter themselves, feeling the need to have more information or to fe just simply feel more comfortable. Because I, f I, f I found, and in fact with that group, is that um, I found that you, you probably, after talking with them for a, for a while, you could probably predict who they would eventually mm. vote for before they know it or were willing to admit it to themselves. Uh, beforehand. In a presidential race, there are very few of those voters out there um, because the, the, the stakes are considered to be high, which is interesting because, of course, it, we find that turnout for elections is highest in the, in the election where your individual vote matters the yeah, least. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you, if you live in one of the 35 states where it's already done, it doesn't matter. Uh, and even within those um, those swing states, you know, you, your vote doesn't matter as much uh, individually. Uh, but of course, when you're voting for your for your local school board, where your property taxes are on the line, <laughs> that's when people don't show up. But anyway, and you can you can actually have an impact. But the point being is that that people pay attention to presidential campaigns. So there so there are very few independent voters. What candidates are trying to do early in that that campaign is move any few independent voters that are there and then lock in everybody else. And so this is a locking in because there are people who could vacillate from one side to the other. Their mind is pretty much made up, but they can vacillate or they could stay home, which is the other option that they have. So you have to lock them in and make sure that they go to come out to vote. And uh, so what the polls are telling us, what the polls should be telling us early in the campaign during the summer is what the registered voters are doing and how that's different from what likely voters are doing. So polls that only give you likely voters are only there to try to make headlines. Yeah. To try to get, they're not there to tell you what the underlying dynamic is. Uh, they're, they're there just to make, you know, give, give uh, the pundits talking points. Uh, one of the things that I found though uh, recently is that there seems to be a much more concerted effort. And I mentioned before that, you know, polls are getting, people are getting more critical of polls. There seems to be much more concerted effort to discredit polls. Hmm. It used to be a, an individual poll would come out and look a lot different than others and they would say, okay, there's this problem and that problem with it. I have found, particularly in this 2012 cycle, is that every media poll, and there's, there are groups out there, and, and these happen to be on the Republican side right now, which is interesting because some of those media polls have the Republican candidate ahead, but every media poll out there, there's a concerted letter writing email effort to say that their, their demographic profile of Democrats and Republicans is wrong. Huh. And you can tell, because and I've talked with other pollsters about this, is that when you start, when you receive the first one or two, you respond to them and say, well, no, it's not. And then you start seeing the same language over and over again with these things. And you find other pollsters are getting the same thing. And so what's it's, driving that? It's, it's interesting because this is the first year that I've seen an actual concerted effort to tr try to, on, on the part of one party, to just try to undermine the credibility of the entire polling industry. Do you think the end game is to make people so cynical about or confused yes. that they say, we're just not voting? And essentially minister yeah, voting? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I, I I'm think not even voting for right. public, just not voting. Right. Um, and I don't know because all, most of the polls in the summer had the race close. Yeah. So a close race is good for the challenger because it means people are excited and they're going to get out there. I think they're worried that, I don't know what, what their end game is, to be honest with you, because it could, it could cut both ways. Um, but it's interesting that they're trying to do that because, of course, it's, it's an echo chamber and they keep feeding themselves, but I'm not sure what the other impact of that is, except don't believe any polls, which is, in some sense, is fine. I'm, I'm actually kind of fine with that. Don't pay attention to individual polls. But once trends starting to build and you start seeing underlying dynamics, such as this group is more enthusiastic than that group, this issue is more important than that issue, those are the things that we as people who observe politics and, and the politicians should be paying attention to. This is what's important to the voter. That's what the poll should be telling us. Huh. Um, what do you think is the, the, the factor that really shapes a person's political identity, self-identity? 
Well, you know, it goes back, I mean, there's been 50 years, 50 years and more research of this, so there are all sorts of models. One is the socialization model, how you were brought up. Another one's a psychological model, um, just, you know, some, what side fills the psychological need. Um, there are cognitive models about, uh, you know, what information is easier for you to obtain and hold. Um, so I, there's no one, there's no one real good issue. What we find is that Many voters, if, if you know, you look at it from an, as an observer from the outside, and you say, okay, rationally, this person should side with that party or the other party, based on their income and race and other uh, statistics about that individual person, and you find that they don't, or they don't for one particular election, um, and so there there are all these unknowables uh, that are out there that that inform people's political decisions, politics, and it's at its basic level, is emotional. That's what people react to. They react to emotion. Well, that's, that's pretty amazing. And like I say, your, your, your job and your science and your art is, is in covering that emotion and uh, giving some insight into that. Well, thanks a lot for coming here. It was my and pleasure, Larry. We'll see you again. Good luck. Anytime. Thanks. thanks for being part of the Hall Institute of Public Policy American Voter Series with our guest today, Professor Patrick Murray.